Hey there, I got a little bit different of a video for you today. This is a presentation by Sean Yadnicek at Wild Hope Farm in Chester, South Carolina. And I attended this tour and workshop about two weeks ago, and I did a video about it, I put out last week about the full tour. And if you haven't seen that, I'll put a link up here, and I'll also link it at the end of the video if you wanna watch it afterwards. You could probably watch it in either order. Sean is a huge wealth of knowledge. He's got at least two decades worth of farming experience. He also was at Clemson University doing research for many years, and he also wrote this book, I would hold up the book, but I don't have the book itself. So I will leave a link down below if you guys wanna check that out. It's a really cool presentation and the folks at Wild Hope Farm gave me the permission to share it. Sean's also gonna be giving this presentation at the farm and other workshops and also at conferences and things like that. So there's a ton of cool information here. It's a little bit different than what you guys are used to seeing probably because it's a much larger scale farm than what I show you and a lot of other farms that I visit. But he's gonna, they're gonna be pushing out to 12 acres next year and really focusing on no-till with cover crop and some really cool tractor tools but in the presentation they go through he goes through all the different cover crops and seasons and things you can use and techniques and really we talk about different size scales and stuff like that and tools so lots of good uh, information for you guys out there and especially if you're in the southeast it'll be even more relevant so enjoy And then there's organic no-till, and there's different types of organic no-till. Um, we are doing an organic no-till technique uh, where we grow the mulch in place. So we're growing our cover crop, using that as a mulch, and terminating that cover crop with the roller crimper. And then there's also, you can also do organic no-till by hauling mulch or compost in. And then, um, and then you can also do a form of uh, organic no-till where you're using occultation. And we have done a little bit of that. It's helpful in the early spring if you um, need to kill a cover crop and it's too wet to get out there to mow and till it. Um, that's what happened to us this year. We needed more space and it was too wet. So we ended up just uh, using this landscape fabric. You can use silage tarps or whatever to block the light. And I know um, it takes at least two weeks. Who's doing that here? I know you, you guys do a lot of that. How long do you think? Two weeks recommend? when it's not 90 degrees, a week when it's 90. Okay. For us Okay. Y'all hear that? It depends on how much is there to break down to. Gotcha. How much you're, you know, if you're transplanting, it doesn't matter that much, but if you're dark seeding, it's kind of be more. Gotcha. Okay. Y'all hear that? So one week if it's 90 degrees, two weeks if it's not, and then it also depends on the residue, um, how much residue needs to break down. But super, if I was small scale, I would definitely. Um, do this technique because it's pretty amazing and then it eliminates a whole slew of equipment that you would need. All right. Okay, so cover crop selection, we'll go over that, then um, how to establish a weed-free cover crop, some roller crimper info, extending the weed suppression, and then pest suppression. Okay, so selected cover crops and all this information, Rodeo Institute, who invented the roller crimper, they've got a lot of detailed information on the cover crops and specifically how much biomass the cover crops produce, which is really important if you are going to do no-till. Let's look at some of, um, I'll, I'm just going to go over some of my favorite cover crops. Um, and, okay. So, I break cover crops into warm season cover crops and cool season cover crops. So, some of my favorite warm season cover crops, Sudex, awesome, one of my favorite. It's a hybrid between sorghum and sudan grass. It uh, produces more biomass than any other cover crop that I know of. Um, you can get up to 22 tons of biomass per acre uh, with this cover crop. Uh, but you need to plant it at 20 to 40 pounds per acre. It's great with weed suppression because it grows super fast. It, will, it emits allelopathic chemicals 
that prevent weeds from growing. So it's like this natural herbicide. It's gonna have an herbicidal effect on all, all kinds of plants out there, prevent them from growing. And then um, that massive amount of biomass and the shading effect. I like to mix the Sudex with cow peas. Sun hemp is another good warm season cover crop. Um, also produces a lot of biomass. You have to be careful with that one. It gets very um, fibrous as it gets older, so you never want to really let it get higher than four feet tall if you're going to um, uh, mow it. Otherwise, it will just bind up your mower and uh, bind up your tiller. It just becomes these basically brokes if it gets higher than four feet tall. So you don't want to have that effect. Um, but I've uh, been experimenting using sun hemp for, with, uh, as a no-till crop for fall planting. And I was very successful when I mixed that with Japanese millet. Um, you want to plant sun hemp at a really high rate and mix it with the Japanese millet. Problem is, is the Japanese millet can only be grown for, you know, it, it, the seeds are viable after about 50 days. So the Japanese millet needs to be, you always want to terminate your cover crops before the seeds are viable. So it's tricky when you mix that with the, the Japanese millet. Um, you can't let the sun hemp get to a size that's really beneficial for, for no-tilling because you've got to terminate it when the Japanese millet, it, uh, before the Japanese millet seeds are, are viable. But this year we did an experiment where I planted the sun hemp at a really high rate of 100 pounds per acre um, because basically when you crimp it, it's the stems that last a long time. The leaves kind of like disappear really quickly and the stems remain as a, as a mulch and that happens with ryegrass too. So when you're doing the no-till, you kind of have to like up your density. Um, however, we weren't able to no-till it uh, for fall production because it was just too weedy. And if I see a lot of weeds in that cover crop, I've learned it's best not to go there with no-till because um, otherwise you're just going to have a weedy mess. Buckweed is a uh, pretty awesome cover crop. It's really short. It can get to a pretty quick size in about a month. It um, goes to seed really quickly. So um, it's, if you do let it go to seed, it's not a big deal. It's pretty uh, not a very competitive weed. But it's a phosphorus scavenger. Um, and it'll also produce a lot of honey. But if you're going to use it as a cover crop and you don't want it to go to seed, you basically need to terminate it about a week into flowering or so. Otherwise, you're going to get some viable seeds out there. So um, it's not super useful as a honey crop, I realize. And it only produces 150 pounds of honey per acre if you let it flower for a very long period of time. But it does attract a massive amount of beneficial insects, those little micro wasps that will help control pests on your crops. All right, go ahead. Okay, Japanese millet, that's uh, another uh, one of my favorite grass cover crops. Really quick, um, drought tolerant, um, but you just have to be very careful. Danger, danger, danger. Those seeds will become viable and that will be the worst weed the following year for you or even that year if you use that as a cover crop. So you'd have to, it, it goes from not, you know, the flowers will come up and then literally like a week later, almost you've got viable seeds in there. So it just happens so quick and the seeds are so small, it's hard to like tell when they're viable. So um, you just have to be super careful with that crop to not let it go to seed. Cow peas, really great cover crop. Seeds are, uh, seeds are cheap, it's available at your local feed store. Um, I like to plant it at a higher rate because I'm usually broadcasting, so I like to go 100 pounds per acre, but it's a nitrogen fixer, super drought tolerant, just kind of a bomb proof crop. Pearl millet um, is a little larger, doesn't go to seed as quickly as the Japanese millet, so that can be a good one, but whenever I've grown it, I always have problems with chinch bugs and rust, so it's just more disease prone um, and insect prone. So. I actually stopped growing that one, but it is a pretty, uh, it does produce a lot of biomass. Not, a, but it's the same amount of biomass as Japanese millet, but it just gets taller uh, and doesn't go to seed as quickly, so there are those benefits. All right. I think it's actually Japanese millet in that picture. Pictures might have been mixed up. Um, so then the cool season cover crops, um, one I used to grow but I haven't grown anymore is mustard. It's a great, uh, planted at about 15 pounds per acre in the fall. First time I planted it, I was like, didn't even realize it was there because it's such a small plant and it just kind of sits, stays small throughout the whole winter. And then come spring, it just explodes and sends up this field of flowers, which is a great forage for bees because it flowers in March when, you, when your bees really need honey. So if you're doing bees, I think this is a beneficial crop to grow. But the only the problem I have with it is um, if we have a hard time rotating out of brassicas, so, you know, for disease um, 
suppression and to prevent disease, you have to rotate out of your brassicas. So if you're planting this as a winter cover crop, this is a brassica, and you're not able to rotate out of the brassicas. Um, so then that causes problems. So I don't really grow this anymore because I want to be able to rotate out of brassicas a little bit easier. But it is a biofumigant, so you can basically till it into the ground and it will you know, kind of sterilize the soil for you if you have problems with nematodes or, or diseases. Cereal rice is one of my favorite crops. Um, it's hard to beat it for everything that it does. It, it's got the level path of chemicals that prevents weeds. Um, it's high biomass, produces a massive amount of um, biomass, and then um, shades out weeds as well. And then it's perfect for no-till because the, the mulch lasts a really long time. And I usually mix that with crimson clover. I used to not mix it with crimson clover, thinking that the crimson clover was kind of diluting the weed suppressing effects of the of the cereal rye because the leguminous cover crops break down really quickly. So if you crimp those and use them as a mulch, that mulch is not going to last very long. Whereas the cereal rye mulch will last six weeks. So that's going to give you a long-term weed suppressing mulch, whereas the crimson clover doesn't last as long. But what I've realized is that crimson clover, unlike a lot of the other leguminous cover crops that you would crimp, um, it's got these flower heads um, and the flower heads don't decompose and it produces so many flower heads that the flower heads act as a pretty good mulch. So mixing that with the cereal rye, I'd like to do some experiments with and without it to see you know, what kind of weed suppression you get. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's done that yet, but I think that would be good, some good research to do. But, um, so if you mix those together and you don't have enough nitrogen in your field, the crimson clover will kind of like, uh, uh, will, will predominate. If you do have enough nitrogen, then the cereal rye will predominate. So I usually like to plant uh, a mix of those, but plant it after I've done the cowpea cover crop. So the cowpea cover crop will provide the nitrogen that will then uh, make the cereal rye a little more vigorous, a little denser. Um, if you don't fertilize that cereal rye, um, it's not going to be very dense and it's not going to give you that good wheat suppressing, suppressing mulch that you need. Um, but then combining the two, you know, you get this understory of crimson clover. And I think overall you get less weed growth during the winter time because that clover will help shade out anything that the cereal rye doesn't. But I still like to have the cereal rye going into a nice fertile field. And the cowpeas can give you up to, you know, 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. I usually probably get 80 to 100 pounds of nitrogen out of them. All right, and then vetch. Um, I don't really grow this one anymore because it matures really late. Um, and it decomposes super quickly, so it doesn't really provide a good weed suppressing mulch if you no-till it. And if you mix it with ryegrass, the vetch, and you crimp it, you got to crimp it with, before the ryegrass seeds are mature. And at that stage, the vetch isn't mature enough to die. So if you plant both of those together, you crimp it when the ryegrass is mature enough to kill. You don't want the ryegrass going to seeds, so you've got to crimp the ryegrass. And then the vetch won't die, the vetch continues to grow and will take over your plants and become a weedy mess in your field. Eventually in our climate, the heat will kill it, but the, the vetch will go to seed and then become a weed problem in your field. So it's kind of more difficult to deal with. Austrian winter peas um, is another good fall planted cover crop. But again, you know, if you crimp it, it's not going to um, provide a long lasting uh, mulch and then uh, it usually winter kills or gets injured in our climate as well. Same way with oats, um, a lot of times they get uh, injured in our cold temperatures. So things that I don't really really plant anymore, but wanted to mention them because a lot of people do still plant them. All right, what else do we have? Okay, so just the, this is kind of the formula that I, that I feel like really works for transitioning a, a field into no-till or just into production in general. Um, so start out always with design, layout of a field, and an irrigation plan. Um, I try to design the fields to where I put the, I like to put the, I follow the key, uh, key line design, Yeoman's key line design. I kind of modified his, his designs for fields because he was uh, designing fields for pasture um, and I'm designing them for, for row crops and vegetable production. So I kind of modified uh, his design principles. But you basically start with your roads. Always place the roads on a ridge. So you need to get a detailed contour map. I would say a minimum of, of two foot contour lines on there. So you can tell where the ridges are in that landscape and where the valleys are on the landscape. 
Um, so you can see here I put the road. It's kind of hard to see the contour lines in this photo. But there's basically a ridge that runs right down the field here. And there's a ridge that goes that way and a ridge that goes that way. So I just place the roads right on those ridges. And you place a road on the ridge, basically that's going to be the high point in the landscape. So all the water is going to always flow off those ridges and keep your road dry. You want your road to always be dry because then you're not going to get puddles. You're not going to have to worry about your harvesting equipment getting stuck. We'll take y'all over there so you can see the, the, mm -hmm. that field after this. Yeah, so it's always key. Place your roads on your ridges and then your field will be very accessible. Um, and then I just kind of broke it up into half acre plots. Once you've got your road on the ridges, then I try to run all my beds off of those at uh, a 1% slope or less. If it's steeper than, you know, one, one and a half or 1% slope, you're going to get a lot of erosion occurring because the steeper that slope is that your bed's on, the faster the water's going to be moving. And as water accumulates during a rain event, it moves down that steep slope. Um, it's going to carry the soil with it. So we just have one area here, you know, I try to line everything up um, so you don't have point beds too. So like this slope here was too steep um, and to really get that less than 1% slope I would have had to like orient the beds this direction, uh, which then means I have a bunch of point beds or beds that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which are less useful. So we do have this one section right here where it's two and a half percent slope. Uh, so it's not ideal for vegetable production if it's that steep. Um, so we basically reduce the slope length, which is one way you can um, reduce erosion because you know the longer the length of that slope is, the more likely it's going to accumulate water that's going to erode the soil away. So we basically put in a cross drain right here on a terrace to help get water off that field and reduce that slope length. But still, we're going to be losing, you know, you can run it through a soil loss calculator, um, go online and, and, and crunch the numbers on that, and you can actually see how much soil you're losing from your fields every year and try to bring it down to an acceptable rate. So we're not really at an acceptable rate in this one square here, this one rectangle, but all the other fields are less than 1%. These are all like around half a percent. Um, so in this section right here, we are losing, you know, probably 10 tons per acre, but it's only a half acre field. Um, so we're going to be losing around five tons per acre, but we're putting on, you know, 20 tons per acre of uh, horse manure and bedding every year. So hopefully we can mitigate our soil loss in that area by just adding, bringing in soil. But just something you want to consider because it is expensive to bring in soil to replace what's just naturally washing away. So you want to reduce that as much as possible. Um, and then laying out your irrigation system. And you can see here, this is what I actually brought into the field to lay it out. Um, you know, I have where all my valve boxes need to be. I kind of broke it into half acre sections. Each irrigated section is a half acre. Um, and then I triangulate in, figure out a distance from known objects in the landscape and triangulate in. So you can basically measure from, create a triangle and measure and get those things placed exactly in the landscape. Some good fact sheets online to figure out how to, how to do that triangulation and, and cite things in the landscape. But having the field drain and being able to irrigate your field is key uh, for no-till production because you don't want any wet areas where the cover, if you've got low spots in your field, cover crops and your vegetable crops are not going to grow very well. So you need a really vigorous, well-growing cover crop to provide the amount of biomass and residue that will suppress weeds. Um, if you don't have that really vigorous cover crop growth, you're going to have areas where you have uh, patchiness and then you're going to have um, weeds coming in there. And then of course, if you have wet areas, your vegetable crops, your cash crops aren't going to grow very well. Phase two, put in the irrigation system. Ideally, you want to do that before you even start in the field because that's going to just create a horrible mess and you don't want to destroy all your, your, your work. <coughs> um, and then comes mowing and disking that pasture and the weeds. And I like to do that over the entire month of May. As soon as I can get in the field, you know, if I can get in in April, start disking it, but I like to do it for a, a whole month time period um, and try to get at least four tillage operations in. That's going to wear down all your perennial weeds and all your annual weeds. If you don't do that, you're going to have just, you're going to be dealing with those for the rest of your life. So it's key to kind of wear those down as much as you can for an entire month period. Uh, for example, this field out here was just a pasture of Bermuda grass. I don't know if y'all have ever dealt with Bermuda grass, but this is like the worst field weed to deal with. So using this 
process here, we were able to get rid of 99% of the Bermuda grass before we even planted it. So the first step in getting rid of the Bermuda grass, or like we had in the backfield, um, fescue, blackberries, a bunch of horrible perennial weeds back there. First step is just disking it for that entire month period and trying to wear down those perennial weeds as much as you can. Then what you want to do after you disk it for that month of May, um, if you have time, do your field grading and road construction. A lot of times they don't have time during that time of year to do that, so you can delay that until after your first cover crop planting and move that to a later time period, but ideally you're doing that after in the spring if you've got the time. Okay, um, and then in the first week in June, first or second week in June, you want to plant your cover crop of Sudex and Cowpeas. And ideally you're planting those into moisture. So letting a rain come up, get the, that flush of, of weeds to grow, and then as soon as your soil is dry, uh, dry enough to do a real shallow disking or, or, or tillage, go ahead and do that tillage real shallow and then plant those seeds into moisture. That way the seeds will come up, but none of the weeds will come up on that surface and you'll get a perfectly weed-free cover crop. So that's kind of key. Uh, the Sudex and the Cowpeas, once they're germinating and growing, they're going to emit those chemicals that will also prevent weed, other weed, the weeds from germinating. Then they're going to shade everything out. And that's Bermuda grass and a lot of the perennial weeds hate that shade. So this is like phase two in killing those perennial weeds. Um, or phase five. <laughs> and then phase six, uh, that Sudex cover crop, basically you don't want it to get too cellulosic or woody or resistant to decay. You want to make it manageable. Um, if you let it get too tall, it's going to be very hard to incorporate and till into the ground later. So you basically, once it gets to four feet tall, you want to mow it down to one foot. And when you mow it, basically what that does is it forces the roots of the Sudex to grow deeper, penetrate the soil, help break it up, and that actually produces more biomass when you mow it. So you mow it, those roots are going to be forced down, you're going to get more biomass production out of that cover crop, and then that, the Sudex, the cowpeas don't regrow very well, they will regrow, but the Sudex will just sprout back up again, and will go right back to four feet tall in three or four more weeks if you've got a lot of moisture, and then you can mow it down to one foot again, and you can do that up to three times a year. And then that's how you get this massive amount of material, this biomass. Just you end up getting, you know, every time you mow it, you're getting four to six inches of residue on the ground. So it's just like someone took, you know, round bales of hay and just rolled them out over your field. You know, I don't know how many, probably, you know, 40 round bales per acre or something. It's just, it's just crazy how much biomass it produces. It's, it's insane. Okay, so then. Um, Basically, uh, so after you're done doing that cover crop cycle, come uh, late summer, early early fall, you want to dis mow it down to the ground and um, disc it again uh, late August, early September. And then once it's uh, decomposed enough, make your raised beds, and then you want to plant your winter cover crop. So this summer cover crop cycle, that will eliminate a lot of your summer weeds summer perennial weeds and summer annual weeds. The winter cover crops will basically eliminate a lot of your winter annual and perennial weeds. So it's, it's key, I think, to have both cycles of those before you, you start planting a field. So when you're doing your winter cover crops, that can be cereal or rye. I like to do cereal or rye and picks and clover, like I was telling you. And then you pretty much don't have any weeds left in your field at that point, and then you can go ahead and plant. Either do your, your roller crimping um, or you're mowing and tilling for your vegetable production and you basically won't have hardly any weeds to contend with after that point. So it saves a lot of time. You see here we're mowing, this is a shot of us mowing that, that cover crop. I mean, it's huge. And this is just my foot, you know, buried in the residue, that six inches of residue. I just wanted to kind of give you a visual of how much material it is when you mow that Sudex down. So you can see in our back field out there we have one little patch where I planted this um, cover crop Celia. Fortunately, it's a cool season cover crop and I planted it in the heat of summer. That's me not doing the research I needed to do on that cover crop and it didn't grow very well. So we didn't have any cover crop in that area. We ended up tilling it down and the soil is like a completely different cover color than the area where we had the Sudex cover crop growing and it's just like a line. You can see it night and day, you know, black and 
bread. <laughs> so it's just crazy how much it changes your soil. Okay, so if you want to get a weed free or uh, get a good stand to cover crop growth, um, when we did that initial planting, we didn't have raised beds. And if you have someone who has a seed drill or precision seeder, our neighbor has a no-till drill. We can email this presentation until afterwards too. I know you can't really see yeah. as well. So we traded him some work and had him come over and plant some cowpeas and sudex. And with the seed drill, you can really get it down to that moisture and get it at a precise depth. And you get really good germination and um, uh, everything is evenly distributed. So if you have access to that, I know the NRCS rents them out. But that can be, you know, a good one-time thing. Um, after that initial transition, everything basically stays on raised beds. So I don't really need to do that again. But if you don't have access to that, you can always um, do some broadcast seeding. It's key to make sure you're not getting any bare areas when you broadcast seed, especially if you're going to no-till your cover crop. You need a perfectly even stand, and you don't want any uh, patches because that's where weeds are going to grow. So the way to do that is to measure and flag out the field, both ends, so as you're walking across it or as you're driving across it, you're not like veering off to the right or to the left and missing big patches. So you can measure and flag. You can also split your seeds in half and run um, half of them in one direction like this and then run the other half that way. And that will give you pretty even coverage, but then it takes twice as long, so I don't like to do that. Um, if you are planning on to raise beds, that's really helpful because those raised beds act as a guide and you're always going to be walking or driving in a straight line across that field any plant. So if it's um, one acre, one to two acres or less, I'm playing one to two acres or, uh, or less of cover crop, I'll just use a bag seeder. Um, doesn't, it's not really worth bringing the tractor out for that. Also, if I'm planting small seeds like the clovers or the millet, you're putting out such a small amount per acre, it's hard to get that rate with any kind of um, you know, cone spreader, unless you have a precision seeder. Even a lot of precision seeders, like a no-till drill, can't handle those small seeds. So um, a lot of the seeders can't handle that, so and we don't have a seeder that can do that, so all the small seeds go out with the bag seeder, which is very difficult when you're planting like eight acres, like I did last week with the bag seeder. I ended up walking probably seven miles. Um, and then if you're doing more than one to two acres, or you're doing larger seed, um, then I like to use the cone spreader because um, you know you're putting out, you know, 1,500 pounds of ryegrass seed with a bag seeder. That's going to be really tiring. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah. <coughs> um, just a, a quick comment. I know we've been experimenting using the. If you're on a very small scale where you're not even going to be bag seeding rates, the Earthway makes a wonderful cover crop seeder if you're doing beds. Uh, and what what uh, I've been experimenting with, and, and a couple of people who are a little further along than me, is doing a bed in the cover crop that you want, and then you can do your aisles in something that's easy to terminate, uh, or something that's going to winter kill to take care of your bed. So that's a way, if you're on a super small scale, uh, to use an earthway seeder to be precise about your seeding rate and sort of what varieties you want where. What size are you talking about? Like, what do you mean by super small scale? Uh, I'm talking like, so we have 50 foot beds and my field field blocks, right? They're not like this. They're eight 50 foot beds. Uh, you know, your stereotypical 30 inch beds. Yeah. So if I wanted to do a plot, then I could use the earthway cedar. Um, if you're dealing with brassicas or mustards, you could use a jag too. Uh, so I'm doing something like clover and rye in the bed but then I'm doing something that's going to winter kill in the aisle. That way I'm not fooling with it in the aisle. Um, and I also don't have that, where the uh, bed is raised, I'm not going to have a problem with not being able to crimp that in the aisle. That's brilliant because we had the issue last year where I did clover over the entire greenhouse and I had such a hard time dealing with the clover and the furrows and then the pathways yeah. in between the beds. If I had done that, or, or like I winter killed, like yeah. that would be a neat little yeah. strategy. That's brilliant. I'm definitely going to do that next time. I got it. I got the idea from Jesse. Jesse got it from somebody else. You know, I don't know who to track that back to. That <laughs> might have more information. <laughs> so we'll ask Jesse where he got it from. Yeah. And and see if we can get a little more information on that. If anyone doesn't know what the Earthway Seeder is, Rachel's got it right there. And they're they're 
they're cheap enough. You know, yeah. I, I think it would be worth if you wanted to experiment with cover crops and you don't have a earthway. It, it makes the job so much better. Mm -hmm. I've seen people bolt them together to use. You could do like yeah. multiple rows at one time. Mm -hmm. yeah. That'd be perfect for cover cropping. So you can see here this uh, buckwheat planting, which wasn't critical that we got it perfect, but you can see if you're not measuring and walking across the field in a straight line. I think Peanut was drunk when she planted this. It's got to give uh, Colin something to stress about. <laughs> Turns out it actually matters. <laughs> what you're seeding, and how fast you're walking. And yeah, so to get those rates right, you know, you can, um, you know, if I'm using the bag seeder, I just, you know, measure out a specific weight um, and then uh, put that out, you know, measure out like 10 pounds and then put it at a setting and then see how far that goes, measure the area or measure the area before the spread and the distance that you want to get and see if you can get that rate out. And you just keep doing it at different settings until you get the right setting um, that's going to put out that right rate. And with the cone spreader, usually it's harder to calibrate with the tractor. Um, when you're using small amounts, I like to do like 50 pounds at a time when I'm calibrating with the cone spreader because there's a, otherwise there's too much variability when you're starting and stopping. You're going to have a little bit less or a little bit more going out. So to really get a good calibration, you have to like put more seed out. When you broadcast like that, do you go back over and till it in or just I'll talk about that. That's a great question. Yeah, so covering the seed, um, there's many, many different ways I do this. Sometimes I do combinations. Sometimes I'll just do one. It just depends on a lot of how much time I have and a lot of different things. But rototilling real shallow is a great way to like incorporate those seeds and get them buried. You know, you can look at the, the, the proper depth of planting those seeds. Like, for example, cereal rye, you don't want to put it deeper than two inches. So then you wouldn't want to rototill deeper than two inches. Um, uh, if you're going over, um, so like I'm doing planting on raised beds, um, I'll incorporate the seeds by either, you know, if the seed is large, like a cowpea seed or a cereal rice seed, I might rototill and then um, bring the bed shaper over it again, or just rototill without the bed shaper. Um, if it's a really small seed, like a clover seed, um, I'll just maybe take the bed shaper over it. Sometimes with cereal, if I'm combining the two, I might plant the ryegrass first, rototill it in, then put the, the clover seed out, and then take the bed shaper back over it. Or sometimes I'll just put the ryegrass and the clover seed out and just take the bed shaper over it. I mean, it all seems to work, but if I'm planting on a flat area, um, I might use a different technique. I'll, I'll run the, I'll, I'll change the orientation of the disc here so the discs are running parallel, and then run those through. Um, kind of help uh, incorporate the seeds. And then um, after that, I might run a cultipacker over it, which will kind of push the, the soil down and give you good seed to soil contact. Um, and you can also incorporate the seeds with a drag chain or a drag hair. And I've done that with the raised beds too, where it'll just kind of fit the shape of the raised beds, but then it does kind of collapse the raised beds as well. So it just kind of depends on the equipment you have. But um, And if you're on a smaller scale and you're using the walk behind, um, yeah, you can do, I think the earthway seeder would be the way to go with that, or you can just rake it in if you're broadcasting, just slightly rake. All right, and then timing is super important. I like to plant the summer cover crops before the moisture levels drop, especially if you don't have a way to irrigate them. So for us, that's going to be, you know, mid-June, usually the moisture is tanking and tanking, tanking. You want to get those seeds in the ground. Uh, preferably, you know, before or after rain. If it's after rain, stale seed bed, get them into that moisture. And um, <clears throat> and then the seeds, once they germinate, they'll j basically just follow that moisture down as it gets depleted. And then even if you have a drought, um, you'll still get good cover crop growth. Um, and then fall cover crops, the trick with that is uh, you generally want to plant them five weeks before your first freeze date. Of course, with climate change now, I'm thinking I used to plant uh, mid-September, but I'm thinking maybe later, plant, planting later is better, because last year we planted mid-September, and we had um, all of our cover crops got wiped out by um, fall armyworms. And I don't know if that was heat related. I've heard other people have problems with that. So I'm thinking, well, maybe planting a little later might be better, because it's usually not freezing until a little later. Maybe the heat had an issue with it. But ideally, you want to get you want to plant those fall cover crops so they're up and growing before the winter cover crop 
or the winter weeds germinate. That way those cover crops are up and growing like the cereal rye is growing and its, its roots are going to start emitting those allelopathic chemicals that will, will prevent any of those winter annual weeds from germinating and growing. Um, so you kind of want to beat the, the winter annual weeds uh, to their growth. But if you plant too early, what happens is any summer weeds that might germinate with your cover crops, they'll have the opportunity to go to seed and then they're going to become a weed the following year. So for example, pigweed, if you have a problem with pigweed and you plant your fall cover crops too early, those pigweeds will grow with your fall cover crops and they're going to have enough time to create viable seeds which are then going to drop on your soil and then the following year you're going to have a major pigweed problem. So timing is everything in farming. And then you have to be careful with, you know, fall planting of cover crops coincides with hurricane season. Um, so if you're having a dry time like we are now and you have steep areas, you want to irrigate those so that you have that cover crop established before the rains come. And that's what we're contending with in our backfield over there. That's a picture of last year um, when the hurricane came. Yeah, we had that issue in field two <laughs> last year. It was crazy. All right. Okay, so I think um, stale seed bedding, um, you know, timing, we just talked about that, but stale seed bedding, a field um, is key. So doing, we talked about that, you know, letting the weeds come up and then getting that tillage in, that shallow tillage, and then planting into moisture. With raised beds, um, you can do that with raised beds too. You know, get your beds established, let the rain come in, do a shallow cultivation with some uh, cultivation uh, with the cultivation toolbar and your tractor, and I can show you how we do that. And then planting your seeds into moisture after that shallow cultivation is key. Of course, this year we didn't have any rain, so we weren't able to do that. Um, so I just I needed to get the seeds out there and planted because I didn't want to plant them too late. I think it was, it was more important to just get the seeds planted as opposed to letting a rain come and then I wouldn't be planting until maybe November, which would be too late. Um, also, just a note to say that stale seed bedding, in general, the way that we do it at this scale is obviously with you know cultivation with larger equipment, but you could use a flamer or you could use a tarp or, but I would just say that that little bit of effort to stale seed bed will go a long way in helping you remove a lot of labor, labor uh, later on. So mm -hmm. Very important. Super key, and never letting any weeds go to seed in the field. We're constantly, you know, you'll never get it perfectly, and then going through the field and just roguing and being sure to pull weeds out um, before those seeds have a chance to become viable. So I'm constantly like looking at any weeds that are out there, checking the seed, you know. How are you pulling them out? Um, usually by hand. <laughs> and if the seeds are viable on there, I'm out there with a the wheelbarrow pulling them out and careful not to like get any seeds in the field. Um, so that's key, you know. I remember when I first started out farming, I would just I would let things go to seed and then the next year I'd be like, oh, that's where that pigweed went to seed. <laughs> There'd just be like this layer of pigweed out there. It's like, there's only one pigweed plant and now I've got this field of pigweed. Um, so it's again, you know, those plants can produce, you know, hundreds of thousands of seeds, so it's key to just not. And then some things, some weeds like, you know, um, lamb's quarters, you know, the lamb's quarter seeds will be viable for 75 years. So you let one of those plants go to seed, you're going to be dealing with weed. Your kids are going to be dealing with the weeds if you pass the farm onto them. So um, just super important to, to not let anything go to, go to seed, for sure. And then your job gets easier every year instead of harder every year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so roller crimper. Um, talk about that. Okay, so you, uh, it's, it's important that your cover crop is at the right stage of maturity. Otherwise, when you run that roller crimper over it, it's just going to pop back up again um, and compete with any plants that you're trying to grow in that area. In our climate, it's not a huge deal. Like the further north you get and the cooler it gets, um, like if you crimp ryegrass and it pops back up again and then you're in a cool climate, it's going to continue to thrive and grow. In our climate, it's so hot that it might pop back up and it's going to languish for a while, but it's eventually going to die. And those seeds, when it does pop back up, uh, the seed heads usually won't produce viable seeds, um, depending on how early you did crimp it. 
But ideally, I like to wait for the ryegrass to be in what's called the milk stage. Some people just do it at full anthesis when the, the flowers are just shedding pollen, but I feel like a lot of times it'll pop back at that stage. So I pull those, those seed heads apart, actually get a seed out, squeeze that seed, and you want that seed to be kind of like watery or milky. You want it to be in that stage of growth. Otherwise, it's going to pop back up and, and continue to grow. If you wait, it goes, so it goes from like the water stage to the milk stage, and then it goes to the dough stage, where you squeeze that seed and it's doughy inside. If it gets to the dough stage, you're going to have viable seeds in that field, and they're going to be germinating um, and then becoming a weed the following year. We had that issue this year where we basically um, crimped a little too late, maybe just a few days too late even, and there were a lot of viable seeds, so we no-tilled it. We didn't really have a problem when we no-tilled it. You know, all of our plants grew wonderful. The cover crop stayed down. You know, didn't have any ryegrass regrowth. But then, you know, we planted cowpeas because uh, we were going to do early uh, spring crops in that area. And those viable ryegrass seeds grew up with those cowpeas. And then the cowpeas winter-killed, and we had this nice patch of ryegrass there. <laughs> which we needed to plant an early season crop set, and then we had to go out and hand weed all that ryegrass because we didn't have a way of tilling it because it was too wet. So you want to avoid those kind of problems by crimping at the right stage. And if you're doing mixed species, um, you need to make sure that both your cover crops are maturing at the right stage. So I think um, crimson clover and cereal rye tend to mature at the right stage, but it's going to depend on what type of ryegrass you grow. Some ryegrasses mature later than other ryegrasses. So I like to grow a bruisey rye. It's the most early maturing ryegrass. And um, it gets much taller. It has more stems versus leaves. Where do you buy that? Um, I just ordered it from Southern States. No, no, I ordered it from the local feed store. You can get it at Southern States or you know, just order it through your local feed store. You can generally get it. I think Athens Seed Company might be where they're getting it from. Coming out of Georgia. How do you spell bruzzi rye? A B R U Z Z I. So it gets really, it gets taller than a lot of the other rye, rye grasses and matures earlier. So if you're doing no-till, you want to plant as early as possible, right? So you want that rye grass to mature as early as possible, so you can crimp it and plant earlier. So I think that's good. But if you're trying to, once you crimp your cover crop, then the the clocks are your cover crop, then the clock starts ticking. So you only have six weeks of weed control from that cover crop. So once you start crimping it, you know, if you crimp it and then you're planting two weeks later, then you're only going to get four weeks of weed control. So sometimes it's nice, um, last year we had a late maturing ryegrass, we had an early maturing ryegrass, and that allowed us to, you know, crimp early and then do a later crimping for the later planting stuff. So it can be beneficial to have two different mature maturation rates in your cover crops. But the later maturing cover crop, the crimson clover was, the seed was viable by the time we crimped that. So the later maturing cover crop, we had a lot of crimson clover regrowth, which wasn't a big deal because the, the heat killed it. <clears throat> All right, um, so I realized you can crimp early if you add two to three inches of mulch to the crimp material. And it doesn't work with everything. It works with mustard. It works with uh, cereal rye. It does not work with crimson clover. Crimson clover, you crimp it early and add mulch to it. It just pushes right through the mulch. But for some reason, if you crimp it early and cover it with mulch, if you crimp cereal rye early, cover it with mulch, it keeps the cereal rye down and prevents it from popping back up. Now, if you crimp it early, cover it with mulch, you want to basically leave the mulch on the cereal rye for about a week or so to kind of occultate it. Um, because if you pull that mulch back to plant through that residue, as you pull that mulch back, you're basically uncovering the cereal rye, and then that cereal rye is gonna have access to light, and it's gonna start regrowing a little bit right by the plants, but not too much. But the main issue with this is having that mulch residue on the soil surface, the soil doesn't heat up, which is a problem with crimping in general in the springtime less soil heat, your plants are going to grow much slower. So you have to account for your plants maturing a week or two later than if they were just growing on bare soil. But with this early crimping, you know, for something like broccoli or kale, 
Um, you know, I did really early crimping, like, uh, when was that? That was like, um, I crimped in like, March, late March, for like, a, no, no, early March, it was late February. When was it? Um, a couple years ago. So it was, when did I cramp? I cramped in late February. Uh, it was after the, the rye grass had sent up like a boot, it was in the boot stage, it sent up like a flower stalk. Um, crimped it for like an early March planting of, of kale and broccoli. And um, what happened was the soil didn't heat up. So then we had freezes. Normally, like in the bare soil areas, the transplants were totally fine because the soil was heating up and keeping those transplants warm. But where I had this early crimping stuff, some of the transplants were just completely dying from the cold because there wasn't the soil temperature to keep those plants warm through the nighttime. So not only did it, did it slow the growth of the plants down because you weren't getting that soil heat, but it was actually killing the plants when we had light frosts. And there's no way to protect a plant, too, with a row cover. So what the, the way row covers work is the sun is heating the soil during the daytime, and then the row cover traps that heat in. So if you have mulch there, the sun is never going to heat the soil. So when you put the row cover over the top of it, the row cover isn't going to do anything. Learned that the hard way with tomatoes one year. We mulched our tomatoes um, too early, and then we had a late freeze coming. I was like, oh, we'll just cover them with row covers. Covered, you know, half of them were mulched, half of them weren't, and covered all of them. All the mulched tomatoes died, and the ones that weren't mulched were totally fine. So, you need that soil temperature for the row covers to work. All right. Any questions? What about using the grass clippings for mulch? I haven't um, done that with the roller crimper. I've just done it, you know, like in my garden. But um, I'm not sure. I think a lot more research needs to be done on that. You know, especially with the early crimping, trying maybe uh, compost, leaves, wood chips, grass clippings, trying all these different things to see how they work with early crimping. And then also trying them just as a, as a way to extend the weed control, like we did with the peppers and the eggplant out there, seeing how those different mulch materials work what thickness to apply to give you a certain amount of weed control. It'd be nice to know, okay, I need, you know, one month more weed control, then I need to apply, you know, a half inch of leaves to give that to me. We'd love to partner with like a research university or something like that to do some studies on these things. Yeah. So we've been kind of talking with some people, but who knows what will happen. Yeah, no one's really doing any of the of the extension of weed ex uh, extending the weed control. By add, we're the only people that I know that are doing this by adding the mulch material. So I think there's a whole ton of research that can be done to help farmers kind of fine tune that, which would help us out because then you don't have to bring if you learn the minimum amount of material you need to put out, that would save you a lot of time. Okay, so crimping late, you know, as I talked about earlier, just choose late maturing um, varieties of cover crops. And then I, oh, this is an, another thing that I realized when I was doing some research at Clemson, is if you um, run the roller crimper over the rye grass, the cereal rye, when it's pre-boot stage, like before it sends up that flower stalk, you can run the roller crimper over it. And that also, I think, delays the maturity of the rye grass too. Again, more research needs to be done in this area, but I think that would be a way to grow one variety of cover crop run the roller crimper over it pre-boot stage, and then wherever you ran the roller crimper over it, it delays the maturity of that cereal rise, and then you can do a later planting. Okay, so what vegetables? I think um, there's just so many you can grow, it's crazy, but the easiest ones are gonna be like summer and winter squash, things that grow really quickly and kind of cover the ground. So if you're starting out with this, I would definitely start out with that, even if you, uh, have a weeds get into your cover crop, um, it, it usually won't be an issue if you're growing summer and winter, winter squash. But I will say this, you know, it's key to have the right amount of biomass. Your cover crop has to be thick enough and um, Rodeo recommends, you know, I think 8,000 pounds of cover crop residue per acre. So you can make like a little plastic square out of PVC pipe or wood and then throw that over your cover crop, cut out the cover crop within that, and then dehydrate it, 
weigh it out and then extrapolate to see how many pounds you have per acre to make sure you have enough residue for good weed control. I've never, my a researcher that I work with at Clemson would do that. I've never done that before. That's way too much work. <laughs> so my recommendation is if you can see the ground, it's not going to suppress weeds. <laughs> if you look at that field of cover crops and you say, that is way too thick for me to walk through, it's probably going to be enough biomass to prevent weed, weeds from growing. You know, if you, if you look at that cover crop field and you're like, oh, I want to stroll through there and pick, you know, ryegrass flowers, there is probably not going to be thick enough. You know, you want to look at that field and be like, that is the best cover crop I've ever grown. I want to call my neighbor up and show him that cover crop because it's so <laughs> dense and thick. Then it's going to be, you know, thick enough for, for no-tilling. So that's the key. Can it be too thick, Sean? Um, it can. I think this field here where we had that uh, late maturing cereal rye, it was called rye and rye. One of the benefits with the bruisey rye is it's, it's like more stem and less leaves. And I think the, the stems are what last longer and prevent the weed control. The leaves just kind of like shrivel up and don't give you as long of weed control. So it's like the, the stems are, are really important in the, in the cereal rye. Um, but yeah, we, the, with the rhyme and rye, with the more leaves, and it was super thick, really dense, um, we had a hard time cutting through it with our culture on the mechanical transplanter. It just was so thick that the mechanical transplanter couldn't get through it. So I don't know if it was because of the leaves or because it was too thick, but it seems to work better with the bruisey rye, even if the bruisey rye is thick. So I'm not sure, but yeah, I think there, you do reach limits where if you're mechanically transplanting through it, it could be too thick. Now, I'd like to get a bigger culture on our mechanical transplanter so it can tolerate those thicker mulches and still work if it's too thick. Um, but if you're hand transplanting through it, you know, thicker is better for sure every time. Uh, so uh, the first succession of summer uh, squash I usually do on bare soil because it's not early enough to do the crimping. Um, and the same goes for the first succession of cucumbers, but then the second succession, third succession, of cucumbers and summer squash are good to go. Green onions, um, they're much easier to plant in bare soil, but you get the thrip control. So, you know, the first couple successions will be in bare soil, and then as soon as we can crimp, we try to do all those in crimped. Uh, lettuce, you know, helps keep the soil cooler, so the lettuces are going to do better. Tomatoes, um, I do a first succession on bare soil because I want early tomatoes, and then the second succession or third success succession can go in the no till. Um, and that way you don't have the delayed effect um, that the no-till mulch uh, produces. Cantaloupes, um, first, this, last year I did all of our cantaloupes in the no-till. This year I wanted earlier cantaloupes, so we did them in bare soil, the first succession, and then all the other successions were in the no-till. The watermelons were all no-till, sweet potatoes all no-till, peppers, when you add the mulch, those work great. If you don't add the mulch, then you're going to have a weedy mess come midsummer um, with the eggplant and the peppers. And one thing with the eggplant and the okra, not a lot of people do this, but um, if you ratoon them and cut them back to about 12 inches midsummer, they will regrow and produce really well into until the first freeze. That's a great way to extend your production on those crops. All right, so. Just a shot of some veggies growing. No-till. Um, planting. So you know the uh, tomatoes and the peppers are growing out in larger cells, so you can't use a mechanical transplanter on those. They need to go in by hand. It's too thick, you're gonna have to transplant by hand. Mechanical transplanter doesn't work, but um, mechanical transplanter does work well with the smaller cells. Oh, and then, um, so for, for hand transplanting, I like the uh, Rachel discovered that the hori hori is the is the tool to use for that. It's like that sharp, looks like a knife. Um, we got some over there we can show you, and it cuts through really easily. Definitely takes longer to transplant through through the the rye residue when you're transplanting by hand. Um, uh, we also it used a bulb planter at Clemson, which they don't make anymore, but it had the ability to like take out a chunk of soil, and if it was the exact size of your cell, it worked really well. It pulled the soil out and then had this little thing you could pop the soil, 
so you didn't have to like flip the bulb planter upside down. You could just take a chunk of soil out. That worked fairly well. And then, of course, a mechanical transplanter will save a massive amount of time. But um, if you are transplanting by hand, it's better to pre-irrigate because the ryegrass sucks all the moisture out of the ground. So it's just hard. It's like planting into concrete. So you lay your drip tape first, then go ahead and um, makes it much easier to, to make that, that hole in the soil. So just pull it back, plop your transplant in, and then you got to push the soil around it. With a mechanical transplanter, I like to lay the drip tape out before I, put the before I go through the field with the mechanical transplanter and kind of lay it to the side of where I'm going to plant. And then as soon as you finish planting um, that row, go ahead and move that drip tape right next to the plants and then turn it on and give those plants a good soaking. You know, if you have a sprinkler system, run that sprinkler system through, but you definitely have to, to water your transplants in like you would with the bare soil system. We also, this year, um, did some green beans no-till, where he took the coulter, the transplanter through, and cut a furrow, and then I came behind with an earthway and just seeded into that furrow, and I thought it worked pretty well. I mean, yeah. it's a little difficult to push the seeder through there, but... Yeah. And I'd like to get a no-till, a single row or a double row no-till drill so we can plant through the residue. But yeah, as of, um, it did work well using the coulter and it's got a ripping shank that goes behind the coulter. So the coulter is a blade that cuts through the mulch and the ripping shank kind of rips through the soil, allows you to mechanically transplant through it. But if you do, do you, can, you can cut through that and then bring your earthway cedar through and do some large seed crops. I've also done it with okra too. Um, and it would probably work with corn as well, but definitely works with beans. Works with beans and okra. All right, so then, yeah, extending the weed control. Um, I mean, you could pull out the mulch uh, or compost by hand, but um, we use a manure spreader. You can put about two inches of mulch out over a quarter acre and four hours if the material is close by to the field. Also, they adding compost might help with weed suppression, and more research needs to be done in this area. But if you apply the compost, um, you know, in the winter time before the cover crop is mature, you know, it creates a layer of compost that might, and then you crimp the, the cover crop on top of that compost. And I think that compost, if it's weed free, might add to the weed suppression ability of the cover crop. If you're fertile, you know, your your, your ryegrass needs about 70 pounds of nitrogen to get thick and do well. Um, if you do fertilize it, you want to fertilize it early in the season. I made the mistake when you're fertilizing it late, and I was just throwing fertilizer away. It doesn't really do anything unless you get that fertilizer on the cover crop when it's young. Okay, um, but wood chips, you know, if you do use wood chips, I always like to follow the wood chips with cowpeas or some kind of nitrogen fixing crop. Because when you till the wood chips into the ground, they're going to basically immobilize any nitrogen for the following crop. So one way to prevent that is to plant a nitrogen fixing crop in there, like cowpeas. They can tolerate that. They'll actually, it'll actually help the cowpeas because it's going to prevent the wood chips will prevent anything else from growing. But because the cowpeas are a nitrogen fixer, they can still thrive, and they'll kick in the gear and, um, and then produce that nitrogen that's needed to prevent uh, the next crop from not having enough. So always follow wood chips with the nitrogen fixer and then um, the following year you, you generally won't get too much immobilization if you do that. Oh, let's see. But yeah, just adding like one to two inches of leaves or wood chips will have a, you know, you can't, if you did that on bare soil you're going to get tons of weeds going through them, but adding one to two inches of leaves or wood chips a week after you crack really extends the weed suppression period. Um, I've added those leaves or wood chips before planting and after planting. I think it's better to add it before you plant. I don't know. What do you think, Rachel? Add the mulch before you plant? Uh-huh. Yeah. Before. yeah. I don't know if we did it this year. Well, we, we did have issues where, like, when you go to plant, then sometimes the wood chips falling into the hole, which is, like, obviously didn't want that. You don't want that mixed with the, around the soil. Mm -hmm. but. If you add it after you plant, then you have to go back and like unbury the plants a little bit. I think definitely before, and then we just discovered that you really need to like, you know, rip away the wood chips before you start digging your hole. Mm -hmm. And if you use leaves, of course, you don't have that issue. Definitely use leaves if you can get them. They're better than wood chips. Yeah. 
you're talking about cedar wood chips there. Will any type of wood chips work? I think fine? anything works fine, yeah. Yeah, they recommend not using cedar. I don't know why people recommend that because they see, it seems to work we'll fine. We'll see it if you see yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Major issues we're going to have as a result of just dumping our free cedar everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> cedar doesn't really decompose very quickly. So Also can be kind of heavy um, and potentially damage if you were to do it afterwards. Yeah, hit the plant and scar them. All right, keep going. And pest suppression. So yeah, we're talking about this in the field. Okay, the next one. Uh, Jackson, you have a hey, yeah, Sean. But before we get too far past it, um, when you're adding those wood chips to the field, and say you've gone through that particular season of crop, uh, how are you managing the wood chips left in that field block? So when I first was doing wood chips at Clemson, I would actually bring a box scraper through the field scrape all the wood chips out and then add them to my compost pile mm -hmm. um, and then so now I just uh, and then after that I started just tilling them in and then planting a cowpea cover crop to take care or of if it's it. late in the year planting like crimson clover and then that can still tolerate the immobilization and mm -hmm. will pr produce enough nitrogen so you don't um, have problems with the next crop I'm right that this the peppers and eggplants are going to plant garlic into this but yeah, that's going to be something new that we, we try this year. Because um, I usually have a perfectly weed-free, you know, even at the end of the season, it suppresses weeds for so long that there's no weeds in the peppers and eggplants. So we're just going to go through and probably mow those down, plant garlic through that, um, and then add another layer of wood chips to the top of that. Because I usually, before in the past, we've been planting garlic into bare soil and then um, adding wood chips or leaves on top of the garlic, and the garlic pushes through. And it's just a great way to, to plant, to have weed free garlic for the whole year. So this way, you know, we're hoping to get more use out of those wood chips by doing that. It's the same exact amount of space we needed for our garlic too, so it works out well. So we'll see how that works. Haven't tried it yet though. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, cucumber beetles, uh, it's so nice once you switch over to the no-till because it's like, oh, you don't have to spray for cucumber beetles, you don't have to worry about them anymore. Um, and then thrips on onions, and then, you know, just less leaf-footed bugs on tomatoes. And I think the main biological control agents in there are going to be your ground spiders, your beetles, ground beetles, and predatory mites, I think, are doing a lot of the work for you in those systems. Um, cool. And then any questions? <laughs> Our little ads at the end. Gotta get those in. Yeah. If you don't have a roller crimper, smaller scale farming, like how do you, what's the best way to terminate cover crops? Yeah, so they they sell a crimper, Earth Tool sells a roller crimper for a walk behind tractor. Um, and then if you're even on a smaller scale than that, you can take a, a Earth Tool, Tool sells a hand crimper where you can just step on it, but you can also make one if you just take an angle iron. It's just like a piece of metal that's in an L shape. Bolt that to the bottom of a 2x4 and then attach a rope to it. And then you can just step on that 2x4 with the angle iron in the bottom. And you do every 8 inches, you want to step on it. And then that's going to um, crimp your cover crop. So you could probably do you know, a small patch like that. I haven't tried it, but I've heard of other people doing that. Maybe we can open this up. Does anybody you know, who's on a smaller scale have some tips on what they've used and what, that, what works? I haven't done it yet, but I was just going to stand on the BCS, the back of it, and see if that did it. Wait, and ride it. Nice. Or just flail mow it and type it. Yeah, flail mowing. I've heard people just flail mowing too. It doesn't give you as long a weed suppression because it ch mm -hmm. chops it all up. But I've been experimenting with the sickle bar uh, mower on okay. the BCS, so you can kick your tires out into the furrows and you can get a 36 inch. I got an old used one, which is why I started experimenting with it. A new one's expensive, but I've been finding here and there used old BCS sickle bar mowers for 150 bucks. Um, so being able to mow it that way, uh, we'll see if if I can actually get it get something down and workable. I've just been trying to work with the mower itself. Um, but that seems like a pretty good mowing option if you still want to the keep residue. that residue, mm -hmm. but not, uh, and, and chop it up. So you could 
potentially mow it, you're still getting your stem instead of chewing it up and then maybe throwing a tarp over it for a week just to make sure to, to, to kill what is left underneath. It's funny you mention that because the first no-tilling stuff that I did 20 years ago, that's exactly how I did it. Cause I had a smaller farm <laughs> and I took a sickle bar mower through, cut the cover crops, and I was doing edible flowers. So I'd do it with the, the flowers at the end of the season too. But it would like kind of spread the mulch to the side a little bit and kind of scatter yeah. it. And then I'd come back with a rake and I would rake the mulch into like thick kind of bundles and then put those bundles on the bed. So it'd be like bundles of mulch, you know, kind of like lines of mulch that would be thick enough to suppress the weeds. And then I'd come back and like plant right next to those. So that worked, it worked pretty good, I think, for that scale, for sure. Um, and I know a lot of people use T-posts. You're talking about stepping on something, just take a T-post. Oh. And especially if you got an extra hand, um, I haven't done this yet. I've, I've seen a few other people do it. If you've got a hand, you can just tie a rope on either end, and both of you step, and you're still getting quite a bit of weight on the uh, on the sharp edge of that T post. Yeah, that's super Walk. smart because that has that. It's already that. There. Yeah, that angle right there. Yeah, that's smart. Love it. <laughs> All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that presentation. It was pretty awesome. There's a lot of cool information there. A lot of stuff to think about. So, again, I will leave a link down below if you're interested in checking out Sean's book and also the information about Wild Hope Farm. And if you do want to check out that tour video, I'll leave a link right after this video is over. So, hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.